My paper is very, very different to Wendy's. It's more clinically orientated and it deals with some case studies <coughs> plus some theory that we must know. And that's why I've titled it Wound Infection, What You Need to Know to Look After Your Patients Holistically and with Best Practices. In this presentation, I will not be start discussing products. It'll be case studies and outcomes and why I chose to do what I did. But always when I have to start, there is a little bit of theory and some of that theory Wendy dealt with as well, so you'll just have to bear with it. And it's a hard act to follow Wendy. <laughs> I need to tell you that. Okay, so when I set out and asked to do this, I thought, what should we know and what do we need to know? And I thought that the first thing we have to know that wound infections are common and should never be underestimated. And they're becoming more and more common, I think. There's far more cellulitis out there in the elderly than I have seen for a long time. And as clinicians, we must be able to recognise all these signs and symptoms, not just the pain, swelling, heat, but all the other things that go with it, so you can make a judgement of what you want to do and how we're going to do it. And we need to have some principles of practice that we can follow and say, A, B, C, D, E, this is what we want to do. So you have to start off with a definition and it's a complex interaction between the host, the organism and the wound, which is then further complicated by the bacteria cooperation and virulence. And we cannot forget that there are many different <coughs> bacteria have very different vir virulence and one of my case studies that will be dis demonstrated. So we have infection, we have the number, we have the virulence and we have the host resistance. If we have a healthy individual, then their host resistance is great and that might not become an issue. But if they're elderly, it's a different story, isn't it? Because they lack the Langerhans cells in the skin that help fight bacteria, plus other things associated with age. Okay, so we know the clinical signs of infection. We see it all the time. You see the redness and erythema. We see swelling and edema. We see pain. We see odour. We have the heat. We see increased exudate and, oh, and then we can even see pus. Pus is a great thing because it already tells you, once you see pus, all right, that's infected, isn't it? But it goes beyond light. You need to look at their temperature. You need to look at if they have an elevated leukocytes or white cell, are they generally malaised? Is there necrotic tissue in the wound? Because if there's necrotic tissue, necrotic tissue harbours both anaerobic and aerobic bacteria, and we need to know that. So we need to choose what antibiotics as a baseline, not the original, but the baseline. And we know that when anyone comes in with affection, the first thing they do is put them on kefosoline and flagell or whatever they like. And we must remember that our skin harbours bacteria all the time. It's only when we have a wound that it allows. And this is a, a young, an elderly lady who presented into CAS with this wound. You have the typical signs. You've got the purulence. This wound didn't, this wound is an old wound of mine. <laughs> And I couldn't heal this. Every time I did something, it went static, and it stayed static. And we couldn't work out what it was or what was happening. We try, I tried multiple dressings, and then I built, and it was a fresh wound, so you don't think to biopsy a fresh wound. Biopsied it, a malignancy. She ended up losing a leg, okay? You wouldn't think that looking at that like that, would you? So always go and be on the wound and think of other things and why it won't heal like Wendy said earlier. <coughs> and here we have the only chronic wound picture I put up because um, I deal mostly with acute wounds of a gentleman, a diabetic with 
an infection. You can see this clinical signs, tunnelling, and when you probe, guess what? You probe to bone. This man, gentleman ended up losing his um, toe, two of his toes. But I put it there to show you that these are the clinical signs you see and deal with all the time. And if you don't make the right decision at the right time or the doctors don't or you don't <coughs> tell the doctor what you think if you disagree, then you won't get the response you want. So it's very important as clinicians that because the average intern or new doctor isn't experienced with looking at wounds. It's us nurses who look at wounds and make the decisions. So I decided that I sat down and had to think about what I thought were principles of management. And I thought the first thing you need to do, forget about the wound, a holistic assessment of the patient. Why do a holistic assessment? Because it'll allow you to identify anything that's going to interfere with the healing process. Know your clinical signs of infection, like the back of your hand, never forget them. And remember, I haven't discussed biofilms here, because Wendy covered it so well, that um, biofilms will often don't have the clinical signs of infection. They don't, they're not present. You want to decrease, whatever you plan to do, you want to decrease the risk of the complications by early identification. And you want to know how to take a wound swab. And if you take a wound swab, don't forget you've taken it. Check the results. Look for the causative organisms and then you can choose your most appropriate antibiotics. But remember, how do you take a wound swab? I use the Levine method because it, when you use that, you usually grow something. If you do it across the surface of the wound, you're just picking up the surface bacteria in the wound. But when you do the Levine, even, sometimes it hurts a little bit, but you get a result. And that's what you want. You want to know what it is. And these are the, I'm not going to run through it, but these are the common antimicrobials that are grow and the, probably the biggest ones is the strep and the staph. But Pseudomonas, as a plastic <coughs> surgery nurse, is one of my worst um, bacteria to look after, especially donor sites. So if I'm going to look at a patient, I need to know certain things about the patient before I look at the wound. And I put diabetes on the top because in this society, diabetes is on a rapid increase and it continues and they have so many things go wrong. Their immune system is um, stuffed. We know that. They don't heal. And we want to also know if they're immune suppressed. I had a lady the other day who had a, a, a bite on her finger, but she's just in the middle of her third cycle of chemotherapy. She lost the finger. Despite four washouts, it, the bone had just completely disintegrated in three or four, four days with infection. So that's when I go back to that thing I was saying earlier, uh, identify early and get, take action. And we all know with immune suppressed patients that the signs and symptoms of infection don't show immediately. It could take five or six days for the first signs to show. So be wary of that. Also, the comorbidities, have they got arterial disease, respiratory disease, renal disease, or any, I put respiratory twice, twice, ah, sorry, and malignancy. Now, don't ever underestimate an injury. This is a gentleman with just a tiny insect bite on his finger. He's a 40-year-old gentleman, he works outdoor, he has a young family. He um, presented in A&E with this presentation. And you think, oh, that's not much, just some oral antibiotics, send him home. But what, un what lays underneath that? That is right over a joint. And in the fingers you have two, two um, nerves, two tendons and multiple blood vessels. So this gentleman had washouts, everything done right. 
and he ended up with a finger like this. <coughs> he lost loss of income for his family because he was had children and his wife was looked after them. He spent four weeks in hospital. Okay? And it, it doesn't look like that little finger bite could cause that, does it? But it can, so it's really important never to underestimate damage, suspected damage. So, one of my principles, and very important, is don't under <coughs> underestimate the potential tissue damage with infection. The best step is early intervention and identification. You need surgical washout very quickly within a, within a few hours of presentation usually. They usually debride if necessary and usually take a tissue sample, which has become very popular, to identify the bacteria. They need their IV antibiotics, but the most important thing with hands or finger injuries is immobilisation and I haven't put it there, elevation. And they us usually do not extend to the case study I just showed you if you get in early and you get the right treatment with the right antibiotics. <coughs> so, often people come in and um, you see them and you say you should come into hospital um, and have IV antibiotics, but they don't want to. And this next, next case study will demonstrate this. I have a 32-year-old male. He was drunk and fell in, fell in the, and <coughs> scraped his thigh on the cement in the footpath. Not very hygienic, the footpath, is it? Filthy dirty. He presented at A&E two days post four with just slightly reddened and uncomfortable and it was suggested that um, he come in for antibiotics, but he said he was a sole parent with a young child and he couldn't afford to come into hospital because of the money and the expense and someone to look after his son. So he refused, but he turned back. He, we gave him oral, the doctor gave him oral antiflex and we sent him home. Two days later, he represents, okay? And this is the presentation. You can see the indent from the swelling. You can see the necrotic area now that wasn't there on the first presentation. You can see the redness and you can tell that's painful. He went to theatre for a washout and there was a lot of tissue damage. They debrided it. He spent three and a half weeks in hospital, approximately. By the time they washed it out, they debrided it, they drained it, we dressed it regularly for a few days, and then we had to put a skin graft on it. So instead of probably coming in and spending three or four days with the right treatment, we ended up keeping him for that long period of time. So he lost more wages, didn't he? And lots, had to get people to look after his son. So important that we intervene early and I just put that surgical washout and debridement and then he had insertion of the drain you saw, skin graft, three months and you know it really all could have been avoided. Now I'm going to talk about a cellulitis because acute cellulitis and chronic cellulitis is something I see regularly through CAS at least five to six cases a week. I don't know where they all come from lately. And it's acute spreading of infection of the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, and it's characteristic by the common signs we know, pain, erythema, swelling, heat. It commonly only affects the lower limb. You very rarely see cellulitis of the arms. And the most common organism involved is either a strep or a staph. <coughs> it's all right to have a staph, but streps can be very virulent and a lot more damage is done. And I'll show that in a minute. So this is the gentleman. He's a 70-year-old male who presented in a with acute cellulitis of the lower right leg. The leg was swollen and painful. Four days earlier, he said that he'd been bitten by an insect. He thought it was a mosquito on the balcony while he was having tea. <coughs> 
there was no ulcer and he had no tinea. And the reason <coughs> I say that is because tinea is one of the greatest causes of cellulitis of the leg, okay? About 35 to 40%, I can't remember the stats right now. He was febrile and he had a general malaise. And the most thing about him was worse was this severe pain he kept complaining about. And he was generally unwell. He didn't have much of a medical history. He had a CVA and he had a hemiplegia and he had a myocardial infarction and he had no other medical conditions and he wasn't on any drug, significant drugs at all. And that's a picture of his leg on admission. Again, a necrotic area with pus and this bright red leg. And that bright red leg like that is a sign of one particular organism. Does anyone know what that is? A strep, okay, a hemolytic strep. <coughs> anyway, he um, came in, he was still unwell. In a &E, they did the jet, we did the, you know, the ABCs of wound infection, a swab, nothing, and then IV antibiotics, analgesia. He had a lot of pain, and I'm going to stress a lot. He got a basic dressing to his leg. He had a high white cell count, not that high, you wouldn't expect it you could have expected it to be much higher. But 12 hours after he, less than 12 hours after he was admitted, he became more sicker and went into septic shock and was transferred to high dependency. And that is where I saw him. And I looked, the first wound swab grew nothing. And I said, I wonder how they took it. So I took a second wound swab that when I saw him and I did the Levine method because I said it's the only method I use and we found out that and that I did that on the Friday and I came back on the Monday and we changed his antibiotics. But my still my main issue for this man was the amount of pain he had in his leg. He, he would scream if you touched it and yet we, we, had, we knew we had to cleanse it and we knew we had, because we needed to try and reduce the bacteria burden on the surface, but he couldn't even stand you touching it with the hand to just assess it. So I made the decision that um, maybe I should try some Acticote. I had read a lot, of, and this, was, this is a very old case study of mine. It was about the time Acticote came on the market and there was lots of papers about um, act to coat in the use of chronic wounds, but nothing about acute wounds. So I figured that it kicked in my brain that maybe if I tried act to coat, I would have to change it only every three days, and I'd reduce his pain, and maybe I would heal. It would ha I'd see how much healing. We'd already identified that necrotic area, and there's some discussion as if it was something more than a mosquito bite. Do you know? but there was nothing proven. They sent tissue away and nothing, nothing came back abnormal, so we figured it was. But, and then eventually one week um, post-grafting, we um, got this outcome, which was really good, and he was discharged. So the conclusion was, my, my treatment for this patient was not centred around um, so much the infection, but improving his quality of life while he was in the hospital to reduce his pain. And if I could reduce his pain, he'd be more comfortable, he'd be more compliant, and we'd get a lot more done. The second, of course, was to de decrease the bacteria burden, and the other was to promote wound healing. And I think overall, with that outcome, we had quite a good outcome. And if you look at this, we went from that to that to that to that in four weeks. That's, so he had a five week hospitalisation and then he went home to his very supportive family who looked after him. So we had a great outcome, even though it was prolonged hospitalisation. Now my second case study is also a cellulitis, which only I had the other day, and it was horrendous. This 62 year old woman presented with bilateral cellulitis. Her weight was 240 kilograms. So how do you manage that? 
I walked into A&E and I didn't have to ask anyone what bed she was in. I followed the odour straight to her and you could see the nurse there with the mask on saying what can we do for this and the the bed was saturated with the exudate the only other thing too she was very immobile and um, she was waiting for a hip and knee replacement which <laughs> and, um, I didn't say anything but that gate just caused more issues because she couldn't stand her leg to be lifted up to do the dressing. So we had dilemma as well as the problem. And we have a picture. Okay, not yet, must be the next one. <laughs> so she, her cellulitis was due to urine incontinence. She couldn't get up to the toilet fast enough to go to the toilet and she'd wee herself and didn't get cleaned up, okay? But she had a combination of both excoriation as well as the cellulitis. But how do you tell the difference? Because when you, in a minute when I show you a picture, you, <laughs> that's why I forgot I had this slide. <laughs> Okay, so clinically, ops, ops, she had a temp, you'd expect. Her pulse was elevated and her BP was pretty normal. She was morbidly obese. She had a history of AF and arthritis and she was on Lasix for her AF and she was also on Warfarin. But because she was so morbidly obese, she couldn't, she decided that she would only take 20 milligrams of Lasix a day so she didn't, because she wouldn't wee herself if she did that. So what do you think that did? She put on 50 kilograms of weight from being discharged in December to being presenting two weeks ago in the clinic. In the so we had a problem. She also had a low HB because of the warfarin and she had a low INR because she was she couldn't get up and go to the doctors to have bloods done to test and she just kept taking the tablets all the time without and her inflammatory markets were raised as well and here we see it you can see these large crevices and the smell was oh so she also had lymphedema which I didn't say earlier and um, with the lower INR and the low haemoglobin and the odour and my head went to what do I do? How am I gonna... My thoughts were not for the patient but my thoughts were for the staff. How are they going to do this dressing every day? And I thought well she really should have two a day but I, I couldn't do that and what do I need to set, get organised so that we can manage her. So we did, I, I will tell you that I, I scrubbed her with chlorhexidine and then I started betadine pack and packing right into the crevices so that no bacteria could or exudate could form in the crevices. I then um, rang Smith and Nephew and said, I don't have any extra dry, I need it, but I've got two for tonight, can I please have them in the morning? And they arrived the next morning. So we laid extra dry down, packed it, pulled it up and craped it up so the dressing only took, believe it or not, 15 minutes per leg because of how we designed our dressing. The odour went in 48 hours and in 48 hours I changed the dressing regime from the betadine to flamazine and six days and um, this is the right and left leg which shows it more. You can see the lower leg is not cellulitis but actually maceration and you wouldn't know unless you had a closer look and thought about it and you can see it's a urine pattern. You know how they talk about every picture tells a star? So the urine would run down her legs and then pull, okay? So then with the excoriation, it went away in 48 hours. It was fantastic. The betadine dried it out. I was really happy. The top healed beautifully and six days post admission, I had 
these lovely legs, if you could call them <laughs> lovely legs. But she had lost 60, 40 kilograms in that six days because she was now on 120 milligrams of Lasix and she had a catheter in. And now they wanted to send her, they wanted to send her home the next day because I'd healed them and the IV antibiotics, not just me. And I'm saying, well, if you send her home without intervention, we have to look at the whole patient and what they need. What do you want to do? So it was determined, de decided to put a long-term catheter in and put her back on her diet. And her daughter said that she was going on um, light and easy diet at home to lose weight. Because <laughs> her daughter was going on her with her. <laughs> hey? No, 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 no. Well, we know that. So, so, see how two different case studies, both with a cellulitic, were treated totally different for different reasons. Because to handle a patient like this, we have so many OH&S rules now, don't we? That you can't do this and you can't. To have her in hospital for, um, that she was in 10 days, because it took about four days before urology came and decided she could have this and do that. We had to organise the sky lifter, bariatric chair, the bariatric toilet a commode, and of course the bed and the mattress that goes with it. She had four small pressure sores on admission which were healed by the time she went home which we didn't even worry about because we're too worried, worried about doing all this other stuff just to get her out the door. And the nursing staff, because she's a frequent flyer, didn't want anything to do that they didn't have to for her because of her non-compliance with medication and everything. But we still have to do what's right by our patient regardless of what we think. The other thing I want to stress in this talk is know the difference. We need to know the difference between maceration and infection. You look at that, what, what do you think that is? Who says maceration? Who says infection? Somebody has to have an opinion. <laughs> No, it's not both. It is pure maceration. Mm. The negative wound swab, but if you can believe all your wound swab, and my opinion, personal opinion on wound swabs is a different talk. Okay, look, again, know the difference. Is this maceration or is it infection? Yes, no? Look, look at the pattern. The wound's up here and this is down here on the tummy maceration it spells it all over but that can be mistaken if you don't go back and take a holistic picture look at all aspects of your care how are you going to diagnose it just by gut feeling it doesn't work so you need to be able to tell the difference between them it can often be mistaken for infection and you start them on antibiotics that they don't need. You need to have this holistic approach to whatever you do in your practice because that's best practice, isn't it? You need to, if you think there is infection, eliminate if it is or isn't infected. Get a history of the wound, what's been happening. Do a physical examination, use your eyes to tell the picture. Get your blood tests and laboratory tests, tests if you're not sure. And if they have raised inflammatory markers or they have a positive wound culture, then antibiotics as required. And you should never start, I hear this, you should never start antibiotics unless they are clinically unwell and then you may consider them. And the, this case study affected or maceration and I let you make the decision. He's a 70 year old male. He lives alone, he's a diabetic. He's had this leg ulcer for two years and it's a mixed disease. He's got a small um, arterial portion. He's unkept, he has poor hygiene he doesn't care to look, he doesn't look after himself at all. 
he smokes, he doesn't has poor eating habits. So he's got a, a lot of things against him, hasn't he, already? When you look at the wound, you see this presentation. Now I look at that and I say, one leg's got a biofilm probably, he's got that ulcer, it doesn't look good, but he's got maceration there. Has he got maceration and infection? It's very hard to tell, isn't it? Well, I can tell you he has both. We did a swab and we grew back a staph infection. We treated it. We, ha we did cleansing and fixed the slough off the other leg. And we healed. But he had tinea, which was probably the primary, because he couldn't get down there to wipe in between his toes. So he didn't look up. And he didn't care, you know. He just, he didn't, he'd lucky. The colour of his feet tells you he doesn't shower that often, doesn't wear shoes. So, but we had to deal again with the whole picture. We cured the right leg, but the left one, he went, he went home still with an ulcer on that leg, which I'm sure he'll, be, he'll come back in with frequently, as he's another frequent flyer that comes in with a chronic type of um, acute so, acute chronic type of cellulitis and plus being a diabetic but he's still got all his toes which is <laughs> which is which is remarkable for the when you if you met the man that's all I have to say so the management would be is your wound swab and a wound swab I think is only good for the sensitivities if, if you had another way which wasn't painful to get sensitivities to bacteria, I don't think I would worry about them half the time. But it's still the key for, for modern, our practice because we don't have these high fangal tests everyone else has, that you have to work on your wound swab. But if you're gonna do a wound swab, do a Levine because it gets the deeper tissue and you often will get a result. When they roll it over the surface of the wound, you're just picking up the surface bacteria. You're not getting the deeper bacteria. You need to do your blood work up and make sure what's going on. You need your IV antibiotics. You need, in this case, regular cleansing and the most appropriate dressing. And I don't care what you use as your appropriate dressing. We know there's antimicrobial dressings. We know there's the silver. And I think silver has been one of the best things in wound care in the last 10 years. But the, more things will come. I'm not a user of a lot of, in, in, with my acute wound management, I very u rarely use Prontosan, but in a chronic wound like this, it's an ideal product. Um, education, patient education and your staff education. Stress why you want to do something, why you're doing that, and educate the patient on why it's important that he follows these basic steps. And maybe they will not re bit with the same issue six months or six weeks later. And link him to services that may improve the way he eats. Um, hygiene, you know, just someone, a carer to come in and clean the house and do things like that would certainly impact on a patient like this. And next case study is my final one. And it's a 54 year old woman who had surgery she had CA of the breast, quite an aggressive tumour, very aggressive tumour. And we did what we call a nipple saving resection of the tumour. And three days post-surgery, discharged the 12 hours post-surgery. Three days post-surgery, it came back in to A&E with an infected wound. And our management was wound debridement in the still vacuum back and normal saline twice a week and IV antibiotics. It doesn't really tell a picture. The impact of this infection, and infection can impact on the person a great deal, and especially for this one, and that's why I included it now, is the psychological, and you'll see the pictures in a minute, of, and, the, and body image, it's your breast. She was quite a large woman. She wasn't, uh, um, morbidly obese but she was overweight. She had a very painful wound on her breast and the breast was very, very edematous and swollen. It took 14 weeks to heal. Because of that, 
she had to have delayed radiotherapy and chemotherapy. She couldn't have it. They wouldn't do it until she was healed. So she was commenced on aromatasm um, inhibitors to stop the, the cancer growth. She spent three weeks in hospital and finally had to have definitive surgery and correction of the scar. And this is the wound at day three. You can see the thick slough and necrotic where the whole suture line had broken down. Because she had cancer, she was immune suppressed, wasn't she? Um, so, um, and you can see how swollen that breast is. And when you see the next slide, the two together, it stands out more equally. So this is um, eight weeks and it's still quite taunt and swollen, isn't it? And someone painted an eye on there with a texture. We don't know why, but it was just put there. <laughs> I, I, I still don't know why. Someone was being smart, I think. And then um, this is that 14 weeks post-injury after they corrected. And looking at the two breasts, remember I said, there's a very distinctive size and shape. So she had to deal with this injury. But we healed her and she had radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And I don't know how she's going because I don't do be breast care cancer, friend of mine. Okay, so just to conclude, and I hope you've enjoyed it, is that early identification and intervention is essential in managing any infected wounds. The key message is to take home is holistic assessment, know your signs of infection and look beyond the wound. Take a wound swab and if you do, know how to interpret the results so that the best care can be given. Don't ever underestimate the tissue damage that can occur with infection. And my final one, be aggressive with hand injuries. Thank you.